Marcus, welcome to the Easy Conversations podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Uh, we've been able to chat offline and it's given me a pretty good idea of where you've been in life and what you've been able to accomplish. So I'm looking forward to talking about that today in further detail. But before we jump into our conversation, I do want to give you an opportunity to share with the listeners a little bit about yourself and what's brought you here today. Hey, where can Zoom is bringing me here today of <laughs> technology? Yes. But uh, yeah, no, thank you for hosting and deep conversation. On the, I know it's easy conversation, but that is what has brought me here today. Yes. Uh, seeing some of your episodes and knowing what you're about. I myself, I'm a communication coach for parents of preteens, mm -hmm. and I have taught around the world. Right now, I'm back in the Bahamas and around. Mm -hmm. we, we could get into my background. We'll touch on that. But the multicultural aspect of it and human development, and it looked like a beautiful conversation. So yeah, thank you for hosting and having me here. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm looking forward to it. And when we chatted, you mentioned you have a background in journalism and, and more so teaching in terms of English arts, what motivated you to go into that? Like journalism requires a certain level of interest. So what was your interest at the time? And then how has that evolved over the years in terms of you traveling the world and teaching uh, students? What's what? Yeah. How has that, all of that evolved from the beginning to now? I used to write poetry and I'm reaching back. This is my student's book. If you're wondering no. what that is behind me. <laughs> but my book, I wrote a book of poetry, Inspire Life Through Words of Well-Being. I'm good with computers, except I wanted to be a writer. Mm -hmm. And my dad was like, you're not going to go to school to study writing. <laughs> and journalism was the best way to, uh, to still love words, to still love stories, to love communication. And that set me off on the path. That's what started me on the path. And words have always been there for me to process, to order my thoughts. And that's one thing writing is called, it's called organized thinking. And that's what has kept me later on in life, while I was teaching grade nine and grade 12 in high school, international mm -hmm. schools, I set off on the question of how do I teach the ninth graders to tell the most, the greatest story ever told, mm -hmm. which is basically where they are the author the audience and the actor all the same that their life story mm -hmm. that's what the greatest story ever is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was to help answer the mental health issue or the mental health crisis that's happening in the developed world yeah because we are the stories we tell ourselves and that's now that's what's keeping me on the path i plan to do that until these fifth graders are old enough to teach it to their kids mm -hmm. the word is is tied all the way through my life <laughs> yeah yeah and it's as you were sharing that i think i've mentioned on this podcast that Last year, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and I was really inspired, and I continue to be inspired by his story. And one of the things in that book, he, whether it was someone who taught it to him, but something he internalized eventually was the power of words and how we can use our language in such a meaningful way. And I think he definitely learned that when he was serving his term in prison. But there's something deeply profound about that, right? And I wonder if there's something you've come to understand around the use of words and how words can, they give us so much power and agency and how we can express ourselves in this world. And I often think about, I'm very conscious of how I use my words now. And sometimes the occasional swear word will come out, but I'm very mindful of that too, because I can choose different words to express myself. So I wonder what that means for you and how does that? We, we could have a whole podcast just about words, eh? <laughs> yeah. One thing that came to mind, right, when you're speaking. So if I simpl simpl simplify life, I believe it's where we put our attention that helps create our beliefs and then mm -hmm. we take action. It's just that your attention, perception, action. Now, I used to do copywriting, and I guess I still do, but all of us do in a sense, mm -hmm. persuasive mm -hmm. writing. Words are only the arrangement of vibrations. Her name is Furkan. It's, and that, that sound is Furk, ah, mm, five mm. phonemes. But if I put them in different order, that could be Kfn, 
but that means nothing to me. Mm-hmm. But when I put it in that order, Furkan, I get your attention. Yeah. Yes. Now, there's an arrangement of words that made you believe something that causes you to act a certain way. Mm-hmm. And that means if you want to change your behavior, there's an arrangement of vibrations of words out there that can that can bring that about. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you one last thing at, at the very yeah. end of mind. But yeah. So so where is that arrangement of words? First of all, what do you want? What behavior do you want? But where is that mm-hmm. arrangement of words? And have you heard that arrangement of words already, but you just weren't tuned into it? Mm. It's a thought. Yeah. It's a thought. Yeah. It is. One thing I was going to say is, so I worked in Saudi for two and a half years, and I don't know the words of Adan, but when I would hear it, mm-hmm. it does sound beautiful. I'm not going to lie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I was just thinking of that while I was saying it. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. When And just for the listeners, the Adan is the pray, call for prayer, which you, if you're in a Muslim country around the world, you're here. And I spent time in Muslim countries too. And I think the listeners already know this, but I'm Muslim by faith. And I was in Morocco a few months ago and and I hadn't heard that call for prayer. And I know we're going to talk about faith here, so I'll just start now. But what I had taken it for granted and it was so interesting. And I've heard over the years, so many people talk about when they're in these Muslim countries and they hear the Adhan and it, it's been so meaningful for me as I've spent more time understanding my faith. And when I was in Morocco and I was here, it was just, I felt this profound sense of like just connection. And I would look at some of the guys my age or younger around. And for them, it was just background noise because they're so used to it. And for me, it was like a wake up call that, okay, this is, I need to pay attention here. And to your point, I think it's, as you were sharing that, there's that sense of vibration as you touched on. And I've also come to understand that there's energy associated with everything and being mindful of what I'm even listening to, whether that's music, the type of conversations I'm involved in, what kind of podcasts I'm listening to, for example. So how do, is this something you've become aware of and paid attention to and the whole frequency in the information we consume and what we listen to as well? Yes. And it's going to sound a little bit, just I'll say it and you'll figure yeah. it out. While I believe there's energy and vibrations, I also believe life happens and we give it mm-hmm. meaning. Mm-hmm. So just like those words went over those guys' head, it's because they didn't attribute meaning to those vibrations, mm-hmm. to those words. Furkan, if, if anybody hears me say that, they don't attribute any meaning to that. Mm-hmm. I also do believe, how can I say this? I believe life is without meaning, and then we ascribe meaning to it also. So we are creators in that sense. Yes. And we're creators of the world that we live in and our understanding of it. Because... I, we can both experience something and then I hold on to that stress and mm-hmm. i.e. that's trauma, unprocessed stress. Whereas you can exper- have that same experience and then you head right into it saying, oh no, this is a call to action, like a burning yeah. building. Some person mm-hmm. might say, oh, woe is me, I'm losing something. Another mm-hmm. person might say, oh, this is very beautiful. Another person might say, I have to go save someone. It's like life happens and we give it meaning also. Mm-hmm. Now that said, I, I do curate the content of my consciousness mm-hmm. and I do look for beauty and I do try to create beauty. So I'm intentional in what I create and what I consume, but I also know that I have power to choose the meaning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's a very crucial point because life is happening all around us. And I know there was a time where I just lived on autopilot and now there's I think it's important for me to take time throughout the day to pause and pay attention and be aware. And even the smallest little things, right? It could just be the smallest interaction. And I've touched on this before, whether it's just walking past a stranger and smiling, that could have meaning because we've just shared a moment there. 
yeah. maybe that person needed that smile in that moment. Maybe I needed it, whatever it may be. But there's something meaningful even within that small interaction. And sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh no, I was, I was going to say there's a book by Gab, by Brett, Barbara Fredrickson called Love mm -hmm. 2.0. And what mm -hmm. you just talked about was called A Micro Moment of Love. Mm -hmm. It's when two people experience the same experience and then there's a, I use the word joyful, but there's a positive mm -hmm. expression of it and they acknowledge that expression. Yeah, yeah. And, and where I was Canadian. going, <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. And where I wanted to move on to next was because you work with children and you said preteens and help communication. And as a father and just as I've gotten older, I think I always had this sense of awe when I was around children, even when I was 10 or 11 and I'd see four or five year olds or my youngest brothers, eight years younger than me. So just being around babies and children, like there's a sense of awe because they're just so curious and there's this pure innocence around them before we all get conditioned in society. I wonder for you, what's compelled you to work with children and serve a purpose in their lives? And I know you touched on your students as well. And the reason why I bring it up is again, the whole idea of meaning. What's funny? <laughs> I've transitioned out of the classroom and now yeah. I work with the parents. I still care about the kids. Mr. Yeah. Rogers said, if you love the kids, support the parents. Yeah. But the truth is I, I love people, but, and I don't love your kids as much as you do. That's, yeah. That's just the truth. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's a leverage move. I want to reach more people and yeah. you're going to be with your kids longer. I'll support you in that. The, the awe of kids, man. First of all, kids are curious, naturally curious. Yeah. They're coming into this world and it's like everything's unexpected. So they are full of awe. It's like, mm. and this is the interesting thing. The world doesn't change. Just our relationship to it changes. And like that awe that was always there, it's still there. Mm -hmm. But it's, we choose to look past it and it's, oh, that's commonplace. Oh man. But when you're with kids, yeah, you're right. You get to capture that again and you get to introduce them to stuff. The awe is still there, man. You got to find that awe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I try to seek it out more. And for me, one of the ways I've been able to do that is get out. I'm fortunate enough. I live close to the mountains and there's so much awe there. And just sitting yeah. there and yeah. just, yeah, it's just open space and you see the beauty of creation and that just, brings me joy mm -hmm. to your point we can find it still we just need to open ourselves to it and well, yeah before we move on from this point I, I heard one definition of awe is to witness something greater than yourself the expanse of it so the immenseness of it and understanding you have a connection to it so i guess as little kids everything is bigger than them right Yes. And then even still, they're more in that innocent state of they are the universe experiencing itself of just, mm. oh, yeah, there's a thinner membrane, let's say. Mm. But then as we grow older, we're like, okay, yeah, we know how big Canada is or we know how big this is mm -hmm. and we can measure everything. And then mm -hmm. we can also separate ourselves. From it. Mm -hmm. So I guess if we want to get back to that all, like you said, of course, yeah, with nature, but witness something greater than us and understand our connection to it. That's a, also a definition of meaningful. Yeah, and, and to tie it in, and this could be probably a good segue into our next point there, is you can find something greater than yourself in everything. And I think within people. So there's people all around us. And I'm fortunate enough that I get to work with clients now in the therapy side of things. And for me to see the beauty of creation within them, and we were talking about faith earlier, but seeing an aspect of God within them is something bigger than all of us, but yet yeah. we're all connected through this thread. And that to me is again, a form of awe because we're all this form of creation, all very unique in our own ways, but somehow we're still tied to one thread and, and that's the yeah. meaning behind it. May, may I read something real quick? It's Absolutely couple seconds it's called divinity is in our greeting 
I don't know if you can see that. Maybe not. Divinity is in our greeting. What's in the meaning of our greetings between our comings and leavings? Is it the divine in me recognizing itself in you? Or is it more true? The divine in you seeing itself in me. <laughs> Whichever truth you choose of the two meanings, divine is always ever present. Self-awareness residing in the flowing fullness of both our beings. Those were the idea of when you say namaste, mm -hmm. or when you say adios to God, when you even say good morning, God morning, just in all these cultures, there's divinity at the beginning and end of our salutations mm -hmm. and greetings. It's, yeah, the divine in me recognizing itself in you. Or is it mm -hmm. more true, the divine in you recognizing itself in me? Mm -hmm. The answer is yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. And, and you've said you've traveled quite a bit and, and been in different parts of the world and experienced different cultures. And culture is very interesting, right? So culture started somewhere and it had a purpose. And now I feel like we tend to criticize culture and we want to dispense away with it. But there's something deeply profound and beautiful within culture. And as you're saying, there's different greetings around the world. It all starts or started at, from the same place. And the intention mm -hmm. was purely divine, if you want to consider that. What have you experienced in your journeys around the world? Like, what did you see in common? <laughs> what did I see in common? When you said, what did I experience in my journeys around the world? So many things came to mind. To answer, what do I see in common? Mm -hmm. Differentiation to integration. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what that means. Even when we look at mitosis, even the cells separate to organize back towards a specific purpose. That's how the brain is formed. That's how all the cells in our body are formed. And that's how we as individuals are formed in society. With our parents, we are dependent and we separate. And then we reach interdependence. And then we're stronger as a community in interdependence. That's the same in all cultures. Culture actually, hmm. one, how, how would you define culture? And words don't have meanings. People have meanings for words. So well, what's your definition? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, th I think culture for me, uh, this is kind of coming up, up with something on yeah, the spot the here. The but yeah, yeah I think it's <laughs> culture for me is a way of integrating people to find commonality and a sense shared or a shared sense of purpose. That's what emerges on the spot. I love that. Be because, okay, well, we'll see how it matches against mine. It's collective identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People like us do things like this. That's what Seth Godin says. People like us do things like this. Mm -hmm. I love how you said it was purpose. Because when you look at it, our identity is just but our identity. And then we take action based mm -hmm. on our identity. But if it's collective identity, mm -hmm. then it's collectively we're acting like this. So we could all just raise the culture by saying, hey, who do we want to be? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then I think that's that point of differentiation, that point of differentiation doesn't matter anymore because then your focus then shifts to the purpose irrespective of what the color of your skin is, what your background may be, where you came from. I hear you say it doesn't matter. I, I think it does matter. And this is not a point of contention. It's just I'll, I'll tell you yeah. why it matters. Yeah, sure. It's because as there's differentiation, there are different perspectives. So we mm -hmm. can reach that purpose better because we have a better understanding of it from different points of view. Yeah. So there's a specialized approach that you have that's not necessarily mine and I respect it. And there's stuff about you that rub me the wrong way because I know there's stuff within me that rubs me the wrong way. But if we have our purpose in mind, like you said, we, we hold more perspective towards it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I like that because I think then you can focus on differences as a means of building something bigger and better together as opposed to dividing ourselves and, and pushing each other away. I, I, I know I keep on harping on this. It's just because I love our neighbors to the north, but yeah. that's what Canada is, right? In America, there's more infighting, but then in Canada, it's, yeah, we're all different, but we're happy. Yeah, and I know yeah, not all Canadians are happy. Don't I, That's a, <laughs> a gross generalization, but yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair. I think maybe I don't 
fully appreciate it. But I also think the grass is often greener on the other side. And you, and I've often, when I'm traveling, I'm so in, again, using the word awe, in awe of the different cultures there too. And then I come back home and I'm like, oh, okay. It's just sometimes you get used to your environment. And that's why I love traveling. And I'm, I'm assuming it's helped you too, just being in different parts of the world and seeing different perspectives and different ways of doing things. I just hold the world belief that if I was born in your same context, of your same mm -hmm. space, your same time, I would have made all the same decisions you did. Mm -hmm. So then when I meet you, I'm just curious as to how and why you did that mm -hmm. with no judgment. Right. Now, if I travel around the world like that, then it's I, I get to understand what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's an awesome thing because every little bit that you learn, there are 10 things that you don't know. So it's mm -hmm. exponentially growing. And if you lead with curiosity in that, that just means that you'll forever be able to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's being back to that childlike state of being curious. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so... You told you mentioned to me you were also a Bible teacher. So, share a little bit about that. What was that like, and what did you take out of you know, that experience? I was a Bible teacher. I say my belief expanded, mm -hmm. and I hope nothing again. I, you know what I love? I love people who are sincere with what they believe. Mm -hmm. And to be sincere is like saying, it's, "Yeah, just tell me what you believe and what you don't." And my experience being a Bible teacher, I'm still a Bible student though. Mm -hmm. Like I still study it. He said, tell me about that experience. You know what it was? So it was in Korea. And what we would do, usually around midday, we'd, in the morning, we'd teach all the businessmen and the college students before they went off to school. And we would teach all the mothers of the business, the wives of the businessmen and the mothers of the kids who would come in at three o'clock to four o'clock after school. And then we teach the afternoon businessmen. My point being, in the middle of the day, we'd call it Ajuma Hour. Ajuma Hour, Ajumas are married Korean women, <laughs> wives. They're not hanging, like they dropped off their kids and they they just go to English class. Mm -hmm. And then they would just tell us everything. It was like therapy. It really was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we would come with a Bible verse or we'd come with a thought or idea. And they knew what it was. Like they knew it was Bible mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes it would just evolve into, not devolve, it would just... You go where the person wants to lead. And it was just a group of women talking about Korean life, their husbands, their kids, and their stressors and their joys. It was, that was, that's not what all my Bible classes were, but that was right. one aspect that I really do remember that I really do cherish. Yeah. I think one other thing that, that shows up for me is understanding m my practice religion through another perspective. There, there's Islam. There's Islam in the Middle East. There's Islam in the North of Africa. There's Islam in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like it's practiced differently, the approach to it. And yes. when you start to understand that, then you start to have an introspection of, okay, what does it mean to me? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's one of the interesting aspects and in what I've come to learn about teaching I think we can all be teachers, and we are. Sure. And what I've learned from good teachers is they also remain curious, and they don't look at it as a hierarchy. You, know, you can be yeah. the student and the teacher. So what did, as a teacher, <laughs> what were you able to learn from your students? And in a phrase, it's to teach is to learn twice. Yes. That's why I love teaching, because love of learning is one of my virtues. What did I learn from my students? If there's any, if, okay. And I, mind you, that's a very broad question. <laughs> that's Absolutely. a for a decade and a half. Yeah. But yeah. if I had to boil down it, I, I, I learned how to be curious and how to see things from different perspectives. You know what else I learned? Because I'm teaching people who speak English as an additional language. I learned how to simplify my ideas. And I learned how to be patient and make space for another person to express themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, it's somewhat forced active listening. And I say forced because there were times I wanted to, to pull up my hair, but then you reach the breaking point where it's just, I want to make sure this person's seen and they're really making an effort and really trying. And I want to mm -hmm. honor that. 
Mm-hmm. And yeah, it taught me how to listen. Mm-hmm. Wow, yeah. I never thought about it until you asked me that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that because I feel like that's one of the biggest gifts I've taken from becoming a therapist is the ability to listen mm. because there's so much yeah. power and we get conditioned and we often I find live in a world where it's the person who can speak the most that gets the most attention and there's a reason for that but there's something powerful about listening and and the biggest forms of gratitude I experience in my therapeutic sessions is when the person sitting across from me a lot of the times especially when I was working on the not-for-profit side was these people were coming in and they never felt understood in their lives and when mm. they get that moment that one little glimmer of I finally feel understood or just seen and that for me is a moment of gratitude because I was able to play a role in that and yeah it's very similar to what you were what we were talking about of sharing those moments of joy with strangers it's we've created this moment in the therapeutic session that we've been able to give each other a gift of understanding and I feel like teaching can offer that too right as you said the listening part and even just to extend it I, I we mentioned this before but I'm BYOB bring your own beliefs I think at a younger age, because of my prayer life, and I knew I held audience with the creator, with the divine, of just all of this, and I was seen and understood by that. Dr. Dan Siegel speaks about the four Mm -hmm. S's, to be Mm -hmm. seen, to be safe, to be soothed, and to be secure. Mm -hmm. You grew up like that, you grew up with a healthy attachment. Mm -hmm. And I think from a young age, that is what kept me through a lot of turmoil. Um, there's no physical abuse in my house. And not, they're stressors, yeah. But when you can have a conversation, and that's why some people they have, and some people might say that these are imaginary friends, but that's why people, mm-hmm. or children, they create imaginary friends. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then us inside the mental work, or coaching work, and that's actually what we're providing to people who can't do it for themselves. Yeah, as you were sharing that, it's, uh, I've never really put the two together, but a lot of the times, and I had to go through this in my healing journey when I was seeking therapy, is creating a, a safe container for myself and providing the safety that I needed as a child. And often that looks like my current version, this older adult going back in time and just telling my childlike version that, hey, everything's okay. But I wonder how much of that is us seeking that out in our imaginary friends when we're children right and just wanting to be seen and understood and i remember imaginary friends had all these wild characteristics and i think again as that childlike state we're just our imaginations are so vivid that we can just create a whole world for ourselves but i wonder how many times you're creating a space for yourself to be experiencing those four S's. I think as dependents, mm-hmm. we're not tapped into our creating spirit yet. If our parents, caregivers, teachers, and adults in our lives, a lot of times they're trying to control it. Mm-hmm. They're trying to indoctrinate, right? As an adult who's an educator, educate means to bring forth. Parenting means to bring forth. That's the etymology of the root of the word. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to be the source of that safety of that soothing, of that seeing. And as I'm the source of that, the, the vibe of the people around me change. Mm-hmm. And, and I want them to tap into the creative power too. That's why I'm doing this podcast. That's why I'm having this conversation so people can understand their creative power. Mm-hmm. And when you're the source of it, understand you're the source of it. Mm-hmm. I, I think it ha- could have a ripple effect, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing you mentioned was when we're talking about being a Bible teacher and how you said your beliefs have evolved. How have they evolved? What have, what's shifted for you and where do you stand now? And perhaps they may, that may feed into some of the virtues and values that you like to focus on. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I usually don't get it as direct as that. <laughs> yeah. And I always tell people, I always tell people, I'll either tell you the truth or I'll tell you nothing at all. And, and your words are evolved. I say expanded. To sum it up in a book, there's this book called What God Said. 
by mm. I think Donald Walsh. He's the same one who wrote the books Conversations with God. I would say, in my understanding of the divine, all of this, the word that comes to mind is the fullness. Mm. And we see a seemingly separation between me and you. Mm -hmm. Whereas we, I'm full, you are full, and we are actually full. But this separation is so that we can understand what we are, the universe experiencing itself in another way. Mm -hmm. And when I'm respecting respecting of other people's belief systems like that's what they've come to understand it as i gain an understanding of life as i learn at their feet of yeah because i honor their wisdom to say okay in your lived experience how and why do you lean deeply into this i believe if there's seven billion people and i believe in higher forces and greater powers to say it is one yeah i believe it is one and I believe that power is with us. And just like we're saying, all of us could experience the same thing and give a different expression. I believe just as there are 8 billion or 7.5 billion people, we're all giving a different expression of the divine. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm just collecting stories to understand what do you understand of this. And I think that's why I'm a little bit... I don't want to call it looser. I, I'm, I'm just... I know what I believe and I practice what I believe, but I hold it tightly, but I'm also of the understanding that it can also expand even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I appreciate that because as much as you are, and, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's this level of conviction you have, there's still a level of openness to the experience of others that perhaps you can learn from them and further expand your understanding. And I definitely resonate with that because very much like yourself, I do have a deeper conviction of what my beliefs are and what my relationship is to the divine. But I'm also open to the experience of others because even if you look historically, everyone was doing their thing in a different way. And you touched on this earlier, even within the same faith system, you can go to different parts of the world and people are doing it differently. And who are we to say what's right and what's wrong? And I think there's a level of consciousness that needs, you need to be at a certain point to understand that. I, I guess what I've come to learn, and, and I put this in a poem I wrote too, is ultimately all the paths, all paths, lead to him yeah and that's okay too <laughs> but in, in, in islam it is believed that all have come from this one source mm -hmm. i think I, there was a thought i had in there oh in in the book what he said that's the name of the book from donald walsh i'm of the belief that let's call it let's call him God, mm -hmm. is secure, but there's nothing you can do, whereas it's going to be like the wrath or the anger of God of saying you've defiled mm -hmm. me. As in, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm of the belief system that if it's the Im immense, vast fullness of this, he's not offended by mm -hmm. that. It's very similar if a secure person is dealing with a kid and that kid hurls insults at a secure person. Mm -hmm. The secure person knows themselves. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what this kid does in their ignorance, there's no harm that can come to me. Yeah, I agree with you because you can uh, expand the same idea to a relationship. If you're secure within your relationship, then you're okay when your partner is gone or is traveling or away from you. You're secure within yourself. And that's the same idea, I agree. And I think it depends on where you are with your own mindset and healing. If you carry a lot of shame, then you will look at God as being this unforgiving being that's going to punish you. Or if you're just in acceptance that, hey, I'm flawed and I will make mistakes and it's okay, I can learn from these mistakes because this is what life is, then you're more 
not only in acceptance, but you're able to surrender to whatever it might be. And, and I think that's when you get to know a person, it's their value system. What's important to them mm -hmm. that could be given down from society or it could be something that they've chosen said, this is valuable to me. And then when you look at it, every character has a desire. They want something. And then there's something that's stopping them, the conflict. And that's where conflict mm -hmm. comes from. There's nothing wrong with conflict. Uh, you get to understand yourself as you go through conflict. But mm -hmm. unless there's introspection, unless they're dealing with the bigger war within, that's what life is about, I honestly believe. Mm -hmm. That's what thyself mm -hmm. and you'll understand the secrets of gods and men yeah. that's what the greeks said but mm -hmm. then in in islam the greater war and then the lesser war outside yeah. yes yeah i agree and speaking of values and virtues i i know we've touched on it a few times but that's something you've shared with me that's what you like to speak about and is this something that you're also working with when you're working with parents of preteens and Indirectly, you're still working with these children, but what are these values and virtues that you'd like to share? For sure. <laughs> I love how you say share because, again, like I said, an educator brings forth. Mm -hmm. So I'm just telling you what I've noticed and I give you evidence and examples. I make an argument for as to why I see this virtue and value inside you. And let me just walk it back. I think a lot of the mental health issues or mm -hmm. challenges that we have it's because of the stories we tell ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say it inside a very reduced language. It's because we don't know who we are. I believe we were born full. Mm -hmm. And then there were stories added on to us that said, we're not the fullness. We're broken. Mm -hmm. We're less than and so on. Virtues is a very specific thing. VIA, virtues in action. They're found in all faiths. They're found in all cultures. What it, they're found in ancient wisdom and in modern science. It is positive psychology. If you go to VIA.org, you can actually take a test. And what these virtues are, simply, they are the actions that we take for the well-being of the collective or the well-being of an individual, such as leadership, creativity, humor, gratitude. Mm -hmm. And there are five unique virtues that are unique to you that you express more, however you express all of them. Mm -hmm. And when I'm looking at you, when I'm talking with you, I'm trying to virtue spot. People virtue signal. And it says, hey, yeah. look at me. <laughs> <laughs> True beauty doesn't ask for attention. True confidence mm -hmm. doesn't seek validation. Mm -hmm. So when I notice it, I'm going to bring it to your awareness of, hey, yo, fair call. Let, let me see. Mm -hmm. Insightfulness, discernment, your ability to actually parse things and think them through. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And now that you got a glimpse of that outside of yourself, like, oh, yeah, that is like me. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit that becomes a part of your identity. Yeah. Values means what it is, what's important to you. That, that's all values are. What some people inside the developed world don't understand, and some people inside the developing world, I, I don't, I hate calling them developing because we're all developing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But for some people, it's finances, for right. other, resources. For some people, it's status. For some people, it's family. And these aren't necessarily bad or wrong things, but it shows you what's important to them. I think the greatest importance is knowing yourself, which is universal. But when you understand a person's virtues and you understand their values, you can understand why they do what they did. <laughs> when the colonizers, when the Brits went down to Southeast Asia, they looked at the beautiful, rich history was there and said, there are no virtues or values here. So they don't share your values for humans. Yes. Yeah, so every time I'm going around the world, I'm saying, okay, what virtues are you expressing? What values are now when I'm working with parents, I'm helping parents establish those stories and then the communication with their kids, because I have a framework, the show up framework and S is it starts with a strong identity. Know who you are. Kids are just beginning. They're going to go through a lot of iterations and a lot of changes. They're actually trying to figure themselves right. out. So they're just at the beginning of it. But I'm actually working with the parent so that they could be uh, established. Yeah. yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I think one of the biggest things we've continued to emphasize directly or indirectly throughout this conversation is 
know thyself. Yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. And it's something that's not given enough attention and underestimated the power of knowing yourself. And you touched on the whole aspect of confidence and, and true beauty. And I think that's what you're able to find when you start doing that work of truly understanding yourself, getting to the point where everything is in alignment, then you're not necessarily seeking that external validation. You're not necessarily seeking the attention to be seen as someone and getting that sense of approval. You're just within your own flow. And how have you been able to find that for yourself? Because you seem you're very intentional when you're talking and, and you put a lot of emphasis on your choice of words. How have you been able to find that within yourself? There is this Aikido master. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. student told him one time, he said, you're so balanced. Because one of the principles of Aikido is to be grounded and balanced. Yeah, yeah. And he said, haha, the thing is that I'm continually being pushed off balance. <laughs> Because, and it, while we are seeking alignment, we are seeking flow, we are seeking all of that, yes, the reason I'm more in tuned into it is because I'm aware of when I'm being pushed off. Mm -hmm. I, I think we shared this inside the, the pre-call, but Rumi said, mm -hmm. if we avoid everything that rubs us the wrong way, however, will we be polished? Mm -hmm. That's how we shine. So we have to go through that resistance. We have to go through mm -hmm. that you have to be broken to be made stronger in the broken places. Yeah. There is some brokenness that you seek actively. There's some that happens to you. Mm -hmm. And there's some that happens while you're trying to maintain. But when we understand this is an inherent part of life, then it's just mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's reframing. And as you were is reframing and saying it's happening for me. It's growth. It's expansion. Yeah. yeah. And we are here to expand. Yeah. And that's why I, you know, one of the books that's really stuck with me is The Alchemist and the whole art of alchemy, the friction and the pressure. And to your point, I think sometimes we have to seek out that friction, right? And I often seek it out in physical ways or mental ways, but those are all opportunities for growth. And often people will ask me, why are you putting yourself through this? It's because... I need this challenge to grow. Otherwise, I won't. And yeah, I, I think to your point, you're constantly being pushed off balance. <laughs> I need to actually chase some other off balance things now. Yeah. I know my own personal problem and I know mm -hmm. I need to get back to get back to it because it is my identity. It is mm -hmm. my values. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to say, yeah, in a phrase, it's not a challenge you choose. Because there's going to come a point when there's a challenge you don't choose. Mm -hmm. And the only way you'll be able to manage it is because you've chosen that challenge before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You have to build that resilience. And otherwise, you, sometimes those difficult challenges arise and you don't know what to do with it because you haven't built that muscle. Yeah. Oh, man. You know, what? Two, two things came to mind. And they're just some things that can only happen over time. If something is important to you and something is of value to it, find it at a younger age before we get the salt and pepper. <laughs> <laughs> what comes to mind is they ask this old man, what is something that you've learned in your old age? He said, other people matter and lifelong friends are really valuable. It's just that you can't make lifelong friends late in life. Like you have to understand that at an early age. Mm -hmm. The second thing is my mother, my, my stepmom, she's, she had a stroke and she's in bed, right? But she's a ray of sunshine. She's beauty. It's like, it's a joy to serve her. And she is, she's sincerely a believer and so on. And I really do believe because of the work that she's put in, mm -hmm. reading her Bible, sincerely believing it, sharing it. Mm -hmm. She's not a judgmental person, but she's, yeah, she's like one of those people. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I see the spirit lives with you. That's what's keeping her in the moment. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean for you when you say a believer? I know that's a pretty broad question. Yeah. But... Nah, you're all good. You're all good. Thank you. Because let me think about it. It When I say a believer, 
Like I told you before, I will always make space for someone who sincerely believes what they believe. If it's to the detriment of me, if I know I'm safe. I remember I had this woman freak out one time because I said, there's, there's a little bit sideways. Yeah. But I was like, if I knew I could be safe, I would have sat down and had dinner with him. Just to, I use the word pick his brain, but to have a conversation as to why he believed what he believed. Mm-hmm. Because when you hear somebody hold this conviction so true, it's just, how did you come to this evidence and examples? Mind Kampf yeah. looks like a, it's, it looks like confused thinking. But right. I'm, because again, I would have made all those same choices had I lived in his context of space and time. Mm-hmm. I'm not justifying it. I'm not saying it's right. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by believer is somebody who is sincere in what they believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah no, I like that. Appreciate it. Marcus, this is, you know, we were talking about at the beginning, how are we going to go about this? And here we are. So it's quite the, the journey and exploration, but I really enjoyed it. It gave me a lot to think about. And I appreciate you asking me some questions as well, because that allows me to think but uh, really enjoyed this conversation. And for listeners that want to find your work or get a hold of you, what are some ways they can do that? I work with parents of preteens. I'm usually on LinkedIn. That's where you'll find me. If you go to my site, marcushiggs.com, you will find my work there. The other work that I publish is just personal stuff that's out and about. Mm. That's all right. But the work that I will always present is my work with parents of preteens. Um, so on LinkedIn or MarcusX.com. Mm-hmm. No, that's awesome. I will put that in the show notes, but uh, thank you again, Marcus. This was quite the conversation. I appreciate your time and really enjoyed just understanding and your views and, and just doing a deeper exploration of what meaning is. I hope that we both, thank you, Iron Sharpens Iron. We both can continue living life with a better understanding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the goal. Absolutely. Right, right, Ken.